I had to click that thing there. All right, here we are. All right, I'm doing all this from one screen, so. This is amazing. A rough, There's a, but, uh, a bunch of people joining. All right. Well, let's just keep it chill for the first couple of minutes, and maybe people can say hello. I'm really curious to see who's. Well, here. unfortunately, that's the that's the technical part that I'm trying to iron out right now is yeah. giving people the ability to say hello. Right, right, right. We're almost. So there. give me a second. I'm I'm figuring it out. Where this is our first time using Discord as the way to manage the audio. Okay, I think I just unmuted everybody. Or give everybody the option. Nice. Sweet. Yeah, I think I think it should be set now. And I'm pretty sure all your audio is coming through the YouTube stream. I think we're good to go. Amazing. Does somebody want to try? Yeah, let me go to the live stream. Here we are. Oh my gosh, look at this full room. How's everybody doing? Yeah. Somebody say something. Can I just click on people, unmute them? Stop. They can't. They can't yet. We got her. This is, this is the thing that's hard to test <laughs> with like just two people. Yeah, exactly. Now that we have people in, we can give it a shot. It should be. I want to hear from you all. Unmute. Let's see. Anita, there. Hi. Hi. Hello. There we go. It's working. All right, I'm slowly adding people as guests. Okay, cool. So it's like a step-by-step. -step. Each person exactly. needs to be like added. Oh, this is very so like fun. Tony, for example, I just added Tony as a guest, so he should be able to unmute. Joni, how you thank doing? you for bearing with us. We'll get it. Tony, are you able to speak? Or anybody? <laughs> Oh, maybe we can kick hmm. off. Still no. That's so frustrating. That's like half half the reason that I was excited to use this right. was to be able to get everybody the ability to speak. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, for sure. Well, I just want to. I want to give everybody the opportunity. I I guess uh, I'll I'll figure it out as we jump in. If yeah, you we'll figure it through. out what we're going to do this session and then uh, I'll keep diving in. We'll figure it out. Yeah, this is all very new and we're, we're figuring out the setup. But uh, I hope people can hear me and the chat should be live. Hello, hello. All right, here we are. All right, I'm doing all this from one screen, so. This is amazing. A rough, There's a, but, uh, a bunch of people joining. I think we're all set on the stream and we can just have we will we can use the Amazing. uh text chat for uh communication until i figure yeah this out. yeah just monitor that chat too and let me know if anything comes up there well I, I think it's working there's like four people viewing the stream online all right i've got it recording locally i think i'll edit it down later too so cool. Yeah, we can just jump into the agenda here. So, we can start with intros. Hi, everybody. I'm Curran. This is the second meetup that I've that I've started. Um, it's trying to reboot this this meetup group here, and I'm thrilled that a bunch of people are uh, attending. So, yeah, I've been working with uh, my friend EJ Fox, who's also here on this Coral Reef hello. project. Hello, hello. 
good to be here. Um, Kern and I work uh, together at Room 302 Studio, which is like a data viz and prototyping studio. And we've sort of been uh, collaborating on projects that, you know, theoretically help make the world better, of which this is one. Um, we basically do work that we hope makes a you know positive impact in the world and coral reefs are like a big uh, piece of climate change and we've been, been doing a lot of climate change work over the past year um and I, I i i see this as an opportunity for the studio to help like guide people to, who want to work in this area so this is more than just the live stream that we're doing now i'm trying to like open up the lines of communication of people who want to work with data and make the world better through data visualization and work on projects like this. So I'm excited for the opportunity to use the venue of the D3 meetup to hopefully make some maps that are both beautiful and useful. Totally. So this is, yeah, this is an actual project that EJ and I are doing. And so it's very much real world. It's not like one of these toy educational sessions where it's like we build a scatter plot but it's it's real, real world, so to speak. Uh, so I, I, you know, to me, this is like a dream client where they're allowing us to do everything open source, work in public, um, spread awareness. Like they want to spread awareness about about this kind of work in the coral reefs. So yeah, I'm really excited to dive into it. Yeah, I'm, I want to shout out Haley Williams at uh, the World Conservation Society, who sort of brought us on, has been leading this project and led us work on this in public and on stream, which is not something that all clients are, uh, are, you know, have an appetite for. And so we're really lucky. Um, but part of the reason that they are letting us do this is that uh, the more people that know about these subjects, uh, the better. So any anyone who has any interest in anything on this, get in touch in terms of if you want to look at data like this, or if this type of project is interesting to you this is exactly uh you know our ideal type of client is somebody who's trying to make the world better and who has really excellent data uh which is what wcs does exactly so and so this project uh Haley came to us and and the story is really it's it's one of the few optimistic and hopeful climate change stories i feel like Whereas a lot of the maps that we've been making for the past few years have kind of been a bummer, uh, you know, showing like, you know, uh, uh, coastal erosion because of rising sea levels or showing the ways in which rivers are drying up. This is actually like a good news story, uh, which I'm going to butcher uh, because I'm not a scientist. But my caveman understanding is that uh, there's some hope around certain types of coral reefs that will make it through climate change uh, for a couple of different reasons that go into uh, biology and science that I don't understand. But what I do understand is that if there are coral reefs that will make it through climate change, that we should make our best efforts to save them from fishing or pollution um, or uh, you know, all sorts of things that might damage them. And in order to protect them, we need to know where they are. And so that's what WCS has been doing a lot of work on is uh, sort of the scientific study and mapping of those things. And once you discover where they are, you should put them on a map and put them in front of lawmakers, which is the next step uh, that we are trying to get to uh, for the UN General Assembly, which is, the I believe, the second week of September in New York City. So part of what we're trying to build is a map that we can put in front of lawmakers so that they can understand, okay, here's a coral reef near me that I can work to protect. And that's why part of the reason I was excited to bring this to the D3 meetup is I know that there's folks who join from all over the world with different perspectives. And I would love to dive into different coral reefs that people are interested in that are local to them. Uh, and that's, that's one of the things I wanna do in this session. So yeah, that's what we're driving towards. I think it's epic, truly epic. So we have some uh, mise en place, which is like what EJ and I, the term EJ and I used to say like everything in its place, ready to go. We did some prep work for this session so that we can just dive into the fun stuff, the D3 coding, the data viz stuff with you all here. So um, yeah, I guess we'll start, I can do like a walkthrough of what we've got so far and the goal of this session, at this time at least, is to add something to this spinning globe 
visualization that we got sort of started with no data in there. Um, and I, I want this to be kind of open. It's an experimental way of doing this where we've got folks here in Discord that where we can talk live. And I encourage folks to speak up and ask questions live. That's fine. Like, don't worry about derailing us. It's all part of the part of the process here. And I've got VS Code running, and EJ is in here, I believe. You're still in this uh, live share, EJ? I think so. I am. Nice. I'm, I'm hearing some people in the Discord are having trouble hearing me. Um, but oh, other than that, I think we're doing all right. Yeah. And I don't know if people can unmute themselves yet, but... Uh, it I'm still working on that. Our dream would be anybody can unmute themselves at any time and sort of pop in with questions and we'll keep working throughout the stream to make that possible. Yeah, I wonder if it's like a settings or anything. So if you go in here, I have it set that any if you open advanced, go back to permissions real quick. If you open advanced permissions, oh yeah, it says that anyone should be able to enter voice chat, speak. Anybody yeah. should be able to speak is my understanding. But I'm hearing that people are having trouble unmuting themselves. Hmm. Well, we'll figure it out for next time. Yep. But I heard Neat I think we're, speak. I think we're under press on. I heard Neat to speak and I heard uh, Izzy speak, so. Yeah, oh, exactly. It works. So if you have a server role, it's working. Uh, and I'll keep trying to give people server roles as we keep pressing on. Nice. So yeah, um, we've got this app sort of scaffolded. I guess I'll start by walking through what's here, or maybe EJ, you want to you want to speak to this? This is like some a skeleton. Yeah, of totally. The, the site. This this is like this is a uh, Kern has a catchphrase: "Get it right in black and white." So this is my attempt at getting it right in black and white in terms of without putting any color or photography or visualization in the piece. Um, just trying to get the rough structure of like, you know, how I want the narrative to go, roughly how it's going to be laid out, um, the different topics that we want to cover, just so, you know, internally and with the client, we can all be on the same page of this is roughly going in the direction that we want to go in. So this is the, I think of it almost as like the Sharpie sketch level of you know everything that we want on the page is now on the page and now it's on us to uh, uh make it real this is even further back right so uh, yeah uh, kern's right now showing a procreate sketch that i made um that before i made the html where i sort of sketched it out and then erased things and sketched more things and this was what led into the sort of rough html version that we're working off now and now we're sort of going piece by piece and visualization by visualization and filling in the blanks. Exactly. So just to look at a little bit the content of this, it's going to be like a, a scrolly telling piece where there's a bunch of points, like there's the intro and like a little bit about the project and then setting the context for global reefs. Like what are we talking about global reefs? Okay, there's global warming. We want to add a chart of the temperature rise and what is the impact of that temperature rise on various things, including the oceans and within the oceans, you know, what percentage of the oceans is coral reefs? And then of those coral reefs, what are the different types? There's these different categories that we're going to get into at some point in this project where there's resist, recover, exactly. and avoid. That's one of the most interesting parts to me is that WCS had, is working with this researcher, Tim McClanahan, who actually wrote a study I think it was the first study identifying these three different types. So part of what they're trying to get across in this piece is that these three types even exist. Like most people think that all coral reefs are the same and they're equally threatened. But part of what we need to get across in our visualization is that there are different types located in different areas and then understanding A, what those types are and B, what makes them resilient to climate change. Exactly. So that's... That's sort of one of the key takeaways is that many of these coral reefs are actually quite resilient to climate change. And those are the ones that, you know, this group wants to focus on preserving. And so, you know, EJ started with this sketch, iterated on this a little bit with the client, got some feedback, and then scaffolded this Nuxt app, which is Vue. So, by the way, we're working in Vue. Uh, we're using this thing called Nuxt. 
which is sort of our go-to tool for full stack uh, applications. And it's EJ's tool of choice. Uh, EJ is more handy with yes. Vue than I am. I'm like a D3 React person who's stepping into the world of Vue. So uh, forgive me, I'm everybody. I'm sort of dragging current <laughs> yeah, into drag the dark side. <laughs> right. I, I, I love Nuxt and Vue. Like, it just works with my brain chemistry, kind of similar to the way that, like, D3, I think, works for certain people's brains. Like, once you sort of understand, like, select and enter and append and exit, like, you kind of understand the pattern. Like, Vue just works like that in my brain and I really like building with it. It helps. I feel like it helps us move uh, much faster. So yeah, the code. We'll get into the code plenty, but just as a, a broad overview, like there's these different folders that are pretty standard Nuxt folders, and then there's like the main page where all this is is scaffolded out, and it, it looks like HTML or JSX, but it's actually view syntax which has some magic where you can insert like JavaScript variables with this colon syntax. And then you can invoke modules, components that are defined separately. And there's some kind of weird uh, magical auto import stuff going on, but you can eventually follow these around in VS Code. Um, but anyway, I think before we get into that, I would like to do a little bit of an overview of the data that we got and the initial explorations that we did with this tool called felt. And then we can dive into the coding part. Does that sound good? Sounds good to me. And then we should also, maybe do you want to go back to that code real quick in the main bit and we can explain live share? Oh yeah. Briefly? Yes. So, uh, let me follow where you are. So one thing that we do is we're using VS Code Live Share, so I can I can join this session and write code in it, and this is really nice because it lets us iterate really quickly. Yeah. Um, so we're going to be using this throughout the session where we write code together, and then I'm hoping at the end of the session maybe we can open it up for more people to jump in and code together. But we use this a lot in the studio for our pair programming sessions, just so like if you have an idea, you don't have to interrupt and ask for it. You can just jump in and add it to the code. And um, we'll probably keep doing this. So if you see another cursor typing, that's me. <laughs> yep. Yeah, man. Pair programming, mob programming, it's, a, it's been a huge, um, I would call it an accelerator for us. Like, I find that we, we just move a lot faster when there's two heads working on the same problem at the same time. And that's what we're going to try today. So we got this data set of this 50 reefs. Um, so part, part of this project is like the data foraging, data gathering, and felt is, is really nice for exploration. This is my first time really using felt, which is a nice mapping product, a pretty new startup. Um, and you can, we should, we should also preface this that like we are coming in as data visualization experts. So this is in almost every project you're like thrown in the deep end, right? Where there's like, there are people who have dedicated their lives to these different data sets. So I just want to give a little forewarning that like we've had a week to look into this, you know what I mean? But if there's anybody I saw already, there's a PhD uh, marine biology person in the chat. Really? Like the reason we're doing this stream is to hear from people like that. Yeah. So if you if we say something wrong, please correct us, right? Like this is like a caveman understanding of the lay of the land. So I just wanted to put that out there up front of like this is this is a week's worth of exploration. Exactly. Yeah. If there's any experts in the house, please do join the Discord and, and talk with us. And because we don't really like, we're sort of figuring out on the fly what it is we're looking for in the data and the patterns and the trends. But anyway, one of the data sources that we were pointed towards was this 50 Reefs project, and they've got this map of points, and each point has a name and the color is if it's if it's one of the 50 reefs or one of the other reefs and i guess these 50 reefs are special because they've been identified as uh, particularly resilient to climate change and i'm not sure if that's i'm not this is the thing i'm not totally understanding is like how those 50 were chosen yeah right this, so i've seen right. there's this list of 50 and then i've also seen a list of like 86 that is like the 50 plus some others. Right. So this is one of the things I want to figure out is, is how exactly to do that. 
Yeah. So I don't I don't really know what like what's different about these as opposed to other ones. But anyway, I got the data out of that map as a CSV file and then I uploaded it to felt and you can see generally where these things are and I've colored it here by oh, lose current. Oh, can you hear me? Did you lose my audio? Oh, yeah, you're back. No, yeah, you're back now, but uh, I broke up for a second on Discord. Got it. Press ahead. So, yeah, I colored it by the name because I noticed that some of them have the same name, and then those are actually close to one another. So these are all the same color, and they're called, uh, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, but South Sulawesi and Flores C. And this is also the same name. And then there's this concept of BCU, which I think we'll be exploring a lot. Uh, I don't know what it means, but I think it's an ID scheme for these coral reefs. But anyway, these are all the same name, and they're like kind of close together. And so, yeah, that's this data set. And then we also found this very highly detailed data set of all the coral reefs. And this one was like 300 megabytes or something. And so my go-to strategy of like making it into TopoJSON and pulling it in with D3 didn't work. We had to use vector tiles. Um, and f you could just drag and drop this stuff into Felt. So I, I don't really know the background or how this data was generated, but it's extremely, extremely detailed. And you can zoom in. Yeah, it's super beautiful. These shapes are crazy. And some of it is like quantized like this, where it's it's like pixelated at a certain level of detail but other parts of the data set don't have that quality. So I, I would guess that it's like a an integration of many different initiatives, maybe over years. But this is this gives us a nice sort of ground truth of like, okay, these are these are all the places that are coral coral, coral reefs, I guess. And so a relatively small subset of those have been called out as the fifty reefs. Which brings us to our final data set, which I'm enabling here, which is, um, I, I dug it up from some scientific study, and this is, to me is the most promising one, because it's simplified. It's like aggregated to this level of detail that's reasonable, maybe to pull into the front end and visualize with D3. And I've colored it by the ID, so it's sort of like a, a map of of where these different coral reefs fall. And like, sometimes it gets confusing. Like, what are you telling me? This this part of the coral reef has one ID. See, this is the BCU ID, number five. And then this other part has a different BCU ID, but they're very close together. So we're, we're sort of exploring all of this together. And I think roughly the BCU IDs may correspond to these named sites. So we're trying to pull all this together and tell a compelling story and uh, wanted to do a live stream to, you know, share it with the world, work in public. It's three overlapping Venn diagram circles. You know what I mean? Like it, like it strikes me like the, the truth sits in the middle of all three of these somehow. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like, yeah. And like some of them are really clear. I remember seeing this one. The Maldives or the Maldives, I don't know how to say it. But this one, this point corresponds very clearly with all of these little coral reefs over here. But when you get into some of these other areas, it's not as clear, you know, which named region is which. But anyway, this is our, our initial exploration. And the goal is to pull some of this into code. So I think now I'll transition over to our app. The first thing we tried is to just embed it. So this is the embedded. Well, let me talk through this section a little bit. So like the, the point in the piece that we're in is when we've talked through the three types of coral reefs. And now we want to give people the ability to globally see coral reefs like near them, or at least understand that they're everywhere and, and to help, you know, if you're a lawmaker from you know, the east side of Africa or um, parts of Mexico or, you know, anywhere these coral reefs are, for you to understand this is a local thing that you can help out with. And so this is the, this is kind of universalizing the specific stories that we're telling and saying here, here's a way to explore them around the world 
and the, the the spinny globe as as we like to call it is one of those ways of, of very quickly seeing that this is all over the world exactly so this felt embed is the first thing we tried i don't think we're gonna i don't think this is gonna land in in the final version it's sort of a poc because um felt has limited options for customization and you can't really pull in anything from felt into your own maps that you make with you know maybe map libre or d3 so that that'll probably go but we're going to migrate some of those learnings into this spinny globe and i got it so that you can actually spin so panning and zooming is working i pulled that from some old uh, reference examples that i got working years ago for this kind of interaction but the goal for today is to bring in some data onto this spinny globe. Well, I can, I guess, start by... Yeah, and I don't even... I guess we need to pick which one. It's probably the points are easiest. Yeah, let, maybe let's start or... with... The, yeah, I, I kind of want to target the points because that data set was called out as important. And also the... Oh, I can't scroll. I can't zoom in there. <laughs> also... Not the most detailed one, but the mid-level detailed one. This one here. I want to try pulling this right. in. Right. I agree. Because you could probably, that's probably not some, like, SVG has a limit of 3,000 things, right? Like, it's probably less than 3,000 yeah. SVG paths to draw all those, right? Exactly. Yeah, so I, I, I at least want to try drawing this stuff as SVG. And if that works and there's performance issues maybe we'll migrate to canvas or something else but uh, i think it's probably so doable get, the next question is what is the format of data that we got this in? like what are we working right with? exactly and i did try to get some of that data in here i put it in public and we've got and this repo, I believe, was shared in the meetup invite if people want to clone it and play along. Oh yeah, this is this is open source. It's there in the in the meetup link. It's this this third link. Awesome. So yeah, y'all can clone it. Uh, PRs welcome if you get something cool working. Um... So yeah, oh, this is a, an, an other, sorry, this is a different data set that I got working in a different map. Maybe it's, this is the one. Oh yeah, this is the one. I forgot to talk about this one. Right, so this is a whole other data set that's like gridded points. So if you zoom in, you can see it's a grid. And each of these points, th this is from the scientific research paper. Each of these points has a score and that score, I think, is a blended metric um, that roughly corresponds with how how resilient it is to climate change. And I whoa, really? I think so. Yeah. And I that's awesome. I didn't know that that data set existed. Yeah. So that's another thing we can pull in. It's just a bunch of points. I think we could, I think we could render that with SVG. But it's it is an awful lot of points. But see, some of these yeah. are very, like this one's blue. This has a very low score, and these have higher scores. Do you think it might be density? Mm, maybe. I don't know. We'd have to go digging. Because it looks like the closer to shore, the more red they are, and like the further out, the more blue. Yeah. I mean, or maybe not. I don't know. Yeah, who knows for real? Who knows? So yeah, that's a cool data set. And I've pulled it out as a CSV, latitude, longitude, and score. So that's something we could potentially also pull in. I kind of want to see how big these files are. So that's two megabytes of CSV. Do you want to do, uh, you want to drop in the match paper? Well, it's points. I guess it's not even can't even be can't even simplified. I actually simplified. I did pretty... yeah I did drop it into Map Shaper, but it's not going to simplify because it's points. It's not it's not regions. Right. But 
this good compromised BCUs, it's only 200 kilobytes. And that is this data set here, which is pretty promising. And I believe it's a GeoJSON extract. Yeah, this is sweet. And then what's the data points we have? Like if you click into one of these features, what do we have? Just like, the BCU ID. Like so the BCU this is ID. what we need to figure out is like how to get metadata from BCU ID. Like what exactly, that means. dude? Yeah, and I I tried googling BCU ID and didn't come up with much. But if there's like a lookup table of BCU ID to name, like that's what yeah. we need. I I, I suspect yeah. that each of these BCUs has some metadata, but it's a, it's such a specialized thing that it's hard to Google. But I figure, you know, we're in a good place to get something to show up in this globe. So this one, oh, it's Topo JSON. So we could pull this in with Topo JSON and, and drop it onto the map. We could also pull in um, like country boundaries, land boundaries from that World Atlas Topo JSON as context for the globe. So whatever we want to do. Yeah, I think getting I think let's get Topo JSON so we can like get, at least get something ugly showing in the spinny globe, right? Yes. Exactly. And just uh, to orient a little, let me just show the spinny globe components. So uh, from the top level, it it invokes spinny globe. And then in spinny, and this was a fun little side project I did. I, I wanted to get hot reloading working with this. And this is, if, if any of you have attended the previous live stream, I got this pattern working with state and set state. And that's all that this is. It's just implementing that pattern in view. So we've got state, which is this object, and then this function called set state that just hooks into views reactivity by setting the value of a ref, which is a view construct and I had to split it out like this because to get the hot reloading working so the globe component oh I gotta follow it one more step oh I'm trying to use VS code to navigate this stuff I just do command P globe there we go so here's the file and it turns out with views hot reloading if you change this file globe.js then this whole component hot reloads so if you manage the state in this component it, re it clobbers the state and redefines it so that's why there's these striated levels of of components here. so this one preserves the state this one does the the view d3 integration so we've got this div that has a ref and then we've got this render function that extracts state and set state from the props and just calls this function, which implements the spinny globe in a framework agnostic way. So this is purely just D3 in here. And it's got the drag handler and the zoom handler to support panning and zooming. So we can add more data into here. Uh, you know, the, the exact path is unclear. But I figure, you know, we could pull it in maybe here, make it a property on the state, and then just use it in the D3 logic. Yeah, I think that's exactly. I think the first step would be to get it in the public folder, and then we request it with d3.json or whatever we might want to use, the same way we would if it were like hosted somewhere. Yes. So I've got this 50 reefs JSON which is the 50 points, which is GeoJSON. So the question is, yeah, which one should we try to pull in first? Well, while you were doing that, I was doing research on what a BCU is. Oh, and yeah? I, found, I found a paper that I dropped into the live streaming chat. Um, so nice. BCUs are bioclimatic units, which Ooh. are each containing about 500 kilometers squared of coral reef habitat over a, a spatially contiguous area. And so uh, this is from another WCS project and they also have a repo, which has all of the BCUs and their report cards and the shapefiles. 
in this GitHub repo that I hadn't seen before. Amazing. Um, but I think this would let us map from the BCU codes to specific metadata, including they have like a PDF report card for each specific uh, BCU that they identified. So I like the BCU data set. I am, I am for it. Amazing. All right, let's do this. I see these BCU IDs right here. It's in this file called 50 Reefs Good Compromise BCUs. So I'm going to copy this path. And then I guess we'll do, see, one fork in the road is do we do the data loading in a framework agnostic way or do we do it the view way? I'm leaning toward doing it the view way. And then just the view way might be frustrating on stream. I'm down to do it, but I think that if we put it in public and do it the D3 way, that it's mm. probably guaranteed to work a little sooner. Yeah. All right, let's do that. I'm I'm totally I'm actually more comfortable doing that. Cool. Yeah, me too, I think. All right, cool. So we can do it in globe. So I'm thinking we can do it here, like if the data is not loaded. For, I'm going to drop the path, public, then load it. And I figure, okay, we got Copilot helping us out. Awesome. This is Love right. It. This is exactly right. The state dot, I kind of want to, because we're going to maybe pull in different data. So we can call it something specific, like... 50 reefs good yeah, just call by the file name yeah 50 reefs bcus yeah although with javascript i don't know if you could start the key with a well no it should be a string let me call it good compromise bcus I'll do camel case. I'll end it with data. Console dot log loading data. Yeah, fetch. All right. Yeah. All right. All right. Robot. Oops. Yeah, this sounds about right. Yes. Oh my God, the robot is so good. So good. But before we do that, let me just console.log it. We might need to pass it through topo.json. And I'll say console.log data loaded. Thank you, robot. Yes. Now, this fetch URL, I don't know if it's correct. We might have to do slash because public is served as the root with Nuxt. That's correct. Yeah, you can take that public out. The like public slash is already included. Yep. All right, let's see if that did anything. I'm going to refresh the page to get a clean slate. All right, it's a topology. So yeah, we definitely have to pass this through topojson client, which I don't know if that's a dependency yet. No, I think you have to import it by itself. You would like import topojson. You'd need the yarn add topojson client and then import it wherever you needed it, I think. It looks like it's already a dependency in package JSON. Oh, sick. Which is surprising to me, but there it is. So we should be able to import. Um, top, I, and I don't. It's I, feature. It's like this, I think. Nice. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. That, let's try that. You want to you want to drive, EJ? No, I don't. Okay, but, but thank you. <laughs> Feature. Oh, I, and I don't remember the syntax, but let's see if we just pass it through feature, if this works. Can I read feature default? Do we have topo JSON client? Like it might be part of D three. It might, you know what I mean. If... Right. Let me let me try the default uh, def, uh, 
importing the default export. Yeah. And just see if yeah. that resolves to anything. Oh no, this seems like it's loading good. It's just not getting data in the format it expects, I feel like. Oh, is it? Just doesn't seem like it's not loading. Yeah. Okay, now we're getting it doesn't provide a default export. So I think it was correct before. We just need to look at an example yeah. that that calls this. I pulled one in. Uh, let me see what it. Let me give you more. So, this is like if I was drawing like a a state map, I would do state. Exactly. Geo, okay. There's a second state... argument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. There's a second argument to it that we need to figure out. All right. Let me pull this down. Yeah. Let me figure out what states looks like. Let me just say console.log good compromised BCUs and see what this, the shape of this thing is. Because I bet there's a property inside of objects. There it is. We're going to grab this name. That's the geometry collection. Yes. This is the part that's always frustrating. Is yeah. That it's like whatever name it is in the topo JSON. Right. Exactly. And so there's your nice reference that you dropped in there. It's going to be very much like this, but instead of states.objects.states, it's going to be... It's, it's you read good compromise BC. And it starts with a number, so we got to do the the string, this, this way of accessing the property like this. And it's not called states. It's going to be called good compromise BCUs. This is too long. I'll call it uh, topo JSON data. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and then that's going to be the top level object. And then this thing is going to be called good compromised BCUs data. Let's see if that worked. Console.log that one. And then there it is. It nice. seems to have worked. All right. So now we can we can call set state like this. And then if we get past this if, we should be good to go. Good to go with data. And then I'll just log out. So the, that can be turned into SVG paths, right? Like we exactly. need to generate a geo path. Yep. Exactly. It says good to go with data. We got it. Oh, it's a proxy object. Oh, we're in view land. OK, that's all right. Yeah. <laughs> that's good, I guess. <laughs> yeah. All right, so now we can access state.goodcompromisedbcs data, and that will be GeoJSON that we can use with um, D3Geo. Sweet. So here's the code that renders the graticules. It'll be kind of like this, kind of similar to this. So are you drawing points or are you drawing features? Oh, this is just graticules. But this is going to be um, features. We can take a look at what it is. It's a, it has a features array. So we should be able to say, yeah, you got it. Well, I realize we're in a JS because what I have, I'll, I'll just put it, I'll put it in here just so you can see, but this is like a, the view way of Rendering oh, that yeah. rather than nice. less all, right? Well, you that's super for useful. on the data features. You know what I mean? Yep. Render shapes from this. And let's see what Copilot has to say. That looks right. Select all uh, dot data. Yes. 
this is what we want to do. So we want to make one path per feature. Exactly. And, and then just and run it uh, through the geo path that we build off the projection. Exactly. And there it is, dot attrd path. Let's see if this exactly. works. That could be magical if it works. Hey, hey. Check it out. Go robot. It worked. It's a little slow on the panning, but basically it works. So is that because we need to simplify and map shaper or what is that? Yeah, good question. Good question. I don't know. It's already pretty darn simplified. It is a lot of paths to be drawing. We could only, we could, st we, I think we're also drawing paths that aren't in view. You know what I mean? So we could have yeah. it, we could do some smart stuff there around rendering. And I'm kind of curious if I, if I switch off the graticules, I mean, I don't think the graticules are very heavy, but yeah, no, that's, so that's, that's a little smoother. What's well, less shapes? Yes. Now, what I really want to do is color these by BCU. And I wonder if stroke is like more costly to render than fill. I, I don't really know. I don't think so. Uh, I want to say something. Shouldn't we have like, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Hello. Hello, hello. Hi. Hi. So can we, if we have country map, will it be better? Right. The lines. That's a great question. Uh, it, so you're saying that we should add like a, a country level boundary so you can understand where in the world these reefs are. Yes. Yeah. 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 That yeah. makes sense to me. That makes a lot of sense. I love that idea. And we get that for free in felt because it has the base map, which is super helpful to set the context of like, where's the land and where's the sea? I'm down to pull in the uh, world atlas topo, Jason. Yeah. Well, there, there's two ways, though, because I don't want to complicate our lives, but there is, theoretically, isn't there a way to have, like, a slippy tile map underlaid underneath the D3 map? So, like, we could use, like, mm. stamen toner tiles, for example, as a hello right. world and have the stamen base map underneath our D3 map. That's, like, another approach. I don't know if the, that might take more time. Yeah, I've seen that, and I think it's a, a huge technical can of worms that I think Phil okay. has solved. So, oh, like, D3... Well, that, that was a roller coaster of a sentence. <laughs> D3 map with tiles, with raster tiles. On a globe. Yeah. Yeah, that's not crazy, right? It's kind of crazy, but I think it's, like, a solved... I think uh, Phil who is the like guru map developer of the D3 world has solved this in some of his client projects. So here's an example from Mike Bostock that pulls in stamen tiles, which is cool, but it's not a globe. <laughs> it's, it's a web mercator, I believe. Yeah. I think you're stuck in web mercator if you want like a slippy map. Yeah. I think that's true. But here's something kind of similar to what we want. But again, it's Web Mercator. Yeah. It's a can of worms, to be sure. Yeah. So I think let's take, you're saying the alternative would be to take a country feature base map and just put that as lines underneath. Yeah. Like, see this example I'm screen sharing here. This is, it just pulls in the country's outlines. And I think it would be super useful, uh, like Nita said to see where the land is and where the sea is. And that's what this will give us. I agree with that. So I, here's a, I just dropped an observable notebook that has a world map in it. Maybe we can like pull out the world uh, file. Where, where did that's you, all set up the top of Jason. Where did you drop it? So in the discord, discord live stream, oh. there's like a little chat just for the voice channel. And if you open that up, that's where I'm dropping it. I'm trying to find that. 
it should be if you hover over the live streaming it's the little dialog box next to the plus sign and the oh there it is sign. nice there it is sweet yeah this is exactly it yeah precisely so maybe we can just rip this out yep and this uh, I could tell you right now, it's pulling it out of um, the Topo Jason World Atlas, which is these pre built Topo Jason files from Natural Earth, which we can pull in from a CDN. See, here's the here's the uh, JS Deliver links. I don't. I think that is hard to do in our current view setup. Like we expect to import things because it does a bunch of tree shaking. I think for us. Mm. But we can fetch them just like we're fetching the data. Yes, accurately. Yes, sorry. Yes. I just don't know which one is which. So the ten oh, M. Go ahead. You're breaking up there. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, so in Vizhub, you already have... Yeah, in Vizhub, there's a lot of examples that pull this in. That's and true. Here is one example where there is already URL and everything. Possibly. I think you're breaking up a little bit, Nita. I saw uh, you dropped... There's a Vizhub link now for that same map in the Oh, Discord nice. Chat. Yeah. Here it is. Here it is. Thank you. This is so helpful. Yeah, because in observable, it's like all observable uh, specific ways of loading data and stuff. But this is vanilla. So we can see where it gets pulled in. Yeah, because map.js basically does what we want to do. And this is already using the exact same pattern that we are using. Or viz.js. Yeah. This is it. So let's start with... Um, Sweet. World Atlas URL. And and there are oh, this is the Visions Carto. I remember now. It's all coming back to me. Visions Carto World Atlas <laughs> is a an active fork that has like fixes for like errors in the data. Sick. Yeah, this is great. I wonder I guess that's also a politically loaded question, right? Because how you draw boundaries now is very depends on who you ask. So oh, I remember yeah. that there was one there was a lot of controversy over one of the main world atlas repos about they were having issues around like Crimea and, and yeah. portions of Ukraine. So I would love, like, I, I, I think using whoever, I think that, that I understand that forks were required to show that in a way that makes sense. Right. <laughs> I mean, look at this, this is a perfect example. Somebody saying like the, the India map is not accurate. And that depends yeah. on if you're in India or, or not, or like, <laughs> yep. just, there's all sorts of, questions around disputed boundaries and you know Bo Mike Bostock has not maintained this in over four years yeah lots changed and he yeah so yeah let's use this Visions Carto version of it and pull it in so we'll start with World Atlas URL love it I can just pull this right into our code and then we have this logic here where it says if the data is undefined, then load it in. Oh, and actually this touches upon the intermediary state of loading. Hmm. So anyway, we can we can do it much the same way as we did this. So load in the world atlas data. Okay, the robot's got my back. If state dot world atlas data is not there, then fetch that URL. Get the response JSON. Call feature with objects dot countries. That's probably right. And then set state and attach that new property. Yeah, that looks about right. And then we can render the World Atlas data 
in much the same way. And this is going to be land. So I kind of want to make it some color. You'll make it like CCC or something? And I got this color yeah, picker plugin. So you can make it, uh, I don't know, land color, <laughs> a little orangish. Let's see how, see what happens here. I got too many tabs open now. Ah, yeah. Nice. A little rough. It's pretty low res, but it's nice in a way to see that context. We could make it much more subtle. Because it's on a white background, I'll make it just a little bit different from white. That's nice. Yeah, that is nice. Thank you this for that. This is smart because now, you know, now you got a sense. Of, yeah, Nita, this is really good. This Thank is you, way Nita, for that suggestion. To understand what you're looking at. Yeah, now I know where where are the ribs, you know. Which yeah. ribs it's ribs not just a bunch of dots. <laughs> yeah, on the wall, you know, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. This is fantastic. Thank you. So, like, uh, now I really want to color those by those BCU IDs. And then if we could, yeah, if we agreed. could do that, I'll call it a success and maybe open it up for questions. How are we doing on time? It's almost four. Doing really good. It's yeah. almost four, yeah. So we could, we could. Uh, I, I mentioned in the YouTube chat. If anybody has any questions, they want to drop in the YouTube chat. I'll bring them up. Same yeah. with Discord. I'm trying to keep an eye on things. Yep. Amazing. So I'm going to remove the stroke and add a fill. Um, but we need to know the field name. Let me see if uh, stuff is coming out onto the console. It seems like I lost track of the proxy object. Well, let me console.log this. I, I want to know what is the name of the field, the exact name. OK, here it is. Properties BCUID. There it is. See? BCUID. Great. So I believe we can map this onto color. By accessing D dot and looking back here, it's it's on a subfield called properties, which is a, ge a GeoJSON thing, because D is the feature. And then if you want to get out the data, you have to say the feature dot properties dot BCUID. And this we want to pass through a color scale. Nice, CJ. So color of that D three dot scale ordinal. Probably going to have to just rework these imports a little bit. Sorry, I was muted and talking. But yes, uh, I was saying all the things that you were saying at the same time. Nice. So I got those imports ready to go. There they are. Oh, sorry for the scrolling. Just trying to get back to where I was. Right, so it should be working now. So yeah, thank you, EJ, for dropping in. Scale ordinal, scheme category 10. Yes, exactly what I would have done. Uh, it's called color. I'll just call it color scale, just because I like to be like a little pedantic. And let's see if that uh, makes some colorful shapes for us. All right. <laughs> oh, look at that. Brilliant. Simply brilliant. See that? Yeah, this is sweet. Okay. My next... Go ahead. 
Uh, so if we make the opacity of the land little bit less and that then the coral reef will be brighter yeah i'm i'm noticing that the land is actually on top of the coral reefs and i, I would actually i think it's an ordering issue where i just want to put the world atlas before those shapes so that's a good call out though Uh, the other thing I, is I would say opacity does have a performance hit. So more opacity that it has to compute would slow down performance a little bit. So I would avoid it if we can. Like, I think if we can solve it with the render order, that would be the most performant idea. So now now we don't have that problem anymore. I rearranged the ordering. Sweet. And Tony's hopping off. Bye, Tony. Thank you for joining us. Super appreciate it. But this is so cool. I mean, now we can actually, oh, look at that, dude. It's coming together. Yeah, this is sweet. My next temptation is to label them. But yeah. like, we don't really know anything about them, right? We're, we also have the table, this like metadata that we're seeing on the right with item value, item value. Yeah. That was meant to be the place where if you click on a reef that you could then see more information about it. Yep. I mean, I could see a future where we compute the centroids of each of these BCU IDs and then put a little text label there. But we need to figure out the name for each ID which comes from, I guess, some other data set. You found a data set, EJ, about that? Yeah, I dropped it in the Discord chat where it's a, it's a GitHub repo that has a bunch of shape files in it. So we might need to extract the metadata out of the shape file. Mm -hmm. Is it this one, local reef pressures? That local reef pressures, yeah, that contains all the BCUs. I think you'll like this repo. Oh, data raw. That sounds nice. Though they're they're also whoa, dude. They got fifty reefs, and then they got these all other data yeah. sets. Whoa. Yep. All right. So, did you find the one? That... These are all shape files too. And if you go onto data, data might be the metadata yeah. this this all reefs yeah this looks promising but yeah. it's all that was the time to do it to just get the metadata with it. yeah I think what I'll do is um, clone this So I'd be curious just to drop that in. You're breaking up, EJ. Sorry about that. Yeah, I want to drop it into MapShaper. I just got to get the files to my machine. Could download zip instead. It's a pretty big repo. Maybe the zip will be faster than cloning. Are you there, EJ? I think I lost you. I am. I was oh, just nice. muting. I'm not sure how good my connection is right now. But yeah, if we could get names. It might not land today in this session, but this looks like a very promising lead. Here's what I'll say. Can you make it so that when you click that we can see the ID, just the ID in the metadata, oh, yeah. and that we can work on the binding? Oh, yeah. Let's do that. So that in here, we can do an on click. Nice. And we don't want to set any state quite yet. Let's figure out. Although I love Copilot, <laughs> so good. All right, so we're going to log out what we see from clicking. 
So if yeah, I... and then you would probably set state like selected ID. Yeah, right? exactly. And you would keep that in the state. Exactly. And then we can watch that state that from sense. view, from like outside. My machine is a little sluggish. Let me close up some things. I can also hop in and drive once we get to the view part. Like once you set state, I can work on doing yeah. the watching and updating and totally. The view. It's still like reloading the page. It's all good. Let's give your poor little machine a break. It's yeah, my, to live stream my, and Discord poor stream little machine. and download data from WGET and yeah. and show the map. What's a, you know what I mean? Let me. I'm gonna cancel this cloning. That could be not something we do right now. Okay. So if I click on one of these, boom! There it is. Click. We got a pointer event. But what is the ID? So one trick I've used is that you can attach the ID as a data attribute and then read it out of the event based on the pointer target. Like the event target will have it. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I think that makes sense if you're using the view infrastructure because it doesn't give you access to the data element. But when we're using D3, we actually do get D, the data element, so we don't have to do that, but it's a good idea. So you can just pass the object all the way through. Yeah, it's a little hack. So let me see. This should be this should be isolating the BCU ID. Let me see if this works. D dot properties dot BCU ID. Yeah, fourteen. Thirty nine. See? Perfect. Sweet. So now we can say set state. Selected bees. Look at that copilot. <laughs> copilot is too smart, man. Got it figured out. So now, all the way up in our spinny globe component. I was gonna say, take me back to my world. Yeah, take dude. me back to all right. where I'm familiar. <laughs> so watch, I guess. Watch and use the new value. I mean, I'll let you take over, but it's gonna be. It's going to be in state dot select BCU ID state ref dot yeah, so let's just get it let's get it logging first yeah. right so we can watch state and then one thing I'm going to do is you have to do an option called deep true and this lets you watch the properties on it otherwise it wouldn't right but theoretically now I should be able to see a console log every time the state changes and now the state changes every time you click on a on a coral reef right? but it also changes every time you pan and zoom so we want to watch the specific property but i'll test this out okay we can watch the specific property so we can do that if we do a little uh make it a function, function right. it'd be uh return state dot uh selected bcu id nice right? So that should do, and we don't need deep true. Yeah, this feels right to me. Then it'll just get what we, what we're interested in. And then, do we want to state is not defined? It's because I need to pass it in. Well, it's really new state because we're watching the state. And is that going to give just the ID? That's a great question. So the state is undefined. Watch state. State ref. ref. Oh, yeah. State value. Ref. Yep. Nice. All right. That Leave. should do it. Let me see what happens now. All right. So I've scrolled down to the spinny globe. If I click on one, it says state change to 14. Boom. Nice. And then I guess we could populate these. Ah, this is where it's going to get fun. We can populate the stuff next to the map. Exactly. So now we go even another step of complication. Yep. 
so we could have some piece of state that is, I guess, above spinny globe. It could live in the page itself? Yes, or I, sometimes I'll put this in like a view store. Ah, um, view but store. It could, it could just... It could also be a ref just in index.view, right? Like right, that's what that I was scheme. thinking. We could do, uh, what is it, selected DCU ID. I'll just take that same thing. Or, out, you know right? what we could do is elevate that whole state object. Well, hmm, I'm just thinking it through. If we elevate that whole state object to this level, then this component would trigger a re-render every time you pan and zoom, which is not what we want. Anyway, as you work, um, as you work continue. <laughs> All of that is correct. I think if I, if we weren't doing this on a live stream, I would do it with the store. Yeah. Um. But you have to plummet all the way through. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, let's just we could we could just do it. Like it's not that crazy. But I think um, we're only watching that sub property, so I don't think it would re-render every time. Like I think if we just look at this specific, instead of new state it would be like it would we do an emit so it would be const define uh const emit define emits would be uh update state but it would do update uh, update bcu you know what i mean and then we mm -hmm. can nice yeah this feels that like emit. Uh, this feels like the right way to do it the view way and then we would on the spinny globe where we include it which is where spinny globe there it is here we would give it an event which is at update pcu or something like that robot gave it a shot nice i don't know i don't know that's kind of it's kind of funky but whatever yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, watch. Nice. So now, if our emits are plumbed properly, we should see the console log with the globe when we click on something, theoretically. I want to try it out. It worked. Wow. Globe 21. Amazing. Amazing. So that means that we know at the top level when that changes. So now we just need to take this ref and put it in the HTML where we have all of that item value stuff. Yeah. So I'll put it here. As like, maybe I'll do another H2. I'll do H2. And I'll do I'll make it yellow so you can see it. Nice. There it is. And that so should be the set. ID of whatever we click. Sweet. Twenty one. Dude, the hot reloading worked. <laughs> oh sick. It is dude. 21 That's awesome. And then yellow. And then if I click on another one. Yeah. Hold on, let me click on another one. Oh, fifteen, huh. there it is. Yep. Okay, cool. There it's it goes. It's working. Brilliant. All right. Yo, this is a victory for today. That's that's amazing. So now And then it, we would need to download that shape file to understand how to map the um the data to like ID to metadata, right? Exactly. So yeah, in an ideal world we're gonna map this number fifteen to some row in some external table which will give us like the name of the reef, the category, I guess, like different metadata, how much at risk it is, maybe. I don't know. A link to the Wikipedia article about it, some nice pictures. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's exactly right. I want to see pictures of reefs eventually show up in here. <laughs> All right, dog. I'm so close to giving you, I'm exporting now a topo JSON from that data that you were trying to download. Nice. That has. A bunch more metadata in it, but we should look at it in Map Shaper because I don't see yeah. BCU ID immediately. But I might be dumb. But I'll send you what I have now in the Discord chat real quick. Cool.
So this is all reefs. It's thirty. It's a thirty-one megabyte topo JSON. I didn't simplify it at all. Ooh, yikes! That's a little maybe, big. Maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll do that. And really, all we need is the metadata, right? The the mapping. Yeah, exactly. So I could maybe I'll export as a CSV as well. Cool. And feel free so to share your screen if you want. The CSV. No problem. I think it's probably easier just to have you drive. All right. You. That's thirteen megabytes too. Yeah, that's just the CSV. Let me grab just like the first couple rows and see if it generally has what we need. So it's got object. <clears throat> Let me open up that uh, with a spreadsheet program and see what we see. Yep, I'm doing the same exact thing. Oh, yes, there we go. We got object ID, which seems like an auto incrementing. I don't know if that's yeah, the same. That Although it could be, right? Like, is that? I guess, how do we sanity check it? But this is cool metadata. It has region, okay, North Pacific Ocean, industrial development versus coastal pop. That could be interesting. T P T H R T, whatever the whatever that means. Oh, and it has the type. Or maybe not. Like it has uh it has uh the is B C U column is interesting. Oh, you know what? This is this data looks familiar to me because this I looked at ah, I remember. I think I downloaded the same data set and I this is the one that has the grid of points with the scores. This is the score. Yeah, and this is amazing because you see, as like a top threat column, I think oh. it's the third of like what what the top th and that's really interesting. Oh, that's it has what tourism, it is. industrial yeah. development, fishing, coastal population. Like this is what's threatening those coral nice. reefs. That's really cool. Interesting. Hmm. Well, so the real question is, how do we get from the ID number? I mean, shit, try object the first column, object I. I think that's just like an ID. And there's some other columns for like BCU something. There's is BCU, BCU NAM. Yeah, maybe see if I can uh, download the whole thing. Yeah, so BCU NAM is there's thirty four thousand blank rows, and then a couple with like a couple hundred each, like Maldives, Kenya, Somalia. Mm. It's like the name of the place. It seems like, but most of them don't have names. Yeah, so if I sort this by the BCU, let me see. BCU name, but do we have BCU ID? to map it into. It doesn't look like we do. Yeah, I don't see it. Hey, uh, I have a question. What is this app that you're looking at this data with? Oh, uh, well, I'm in Linux. This is the thing. This is LibreOffice Calc. It ships with Linux. It's oh, okay. It okay, ships okay. with Ubuntu. It's like a, it's part of LibreOffice. It's an open source. It's just a, like a spreadsheet app? Yeah, it's kind of like Excel. It's an open source oh. ripoff of Excel that's kind of half-baked. Kind of DIY, but it's good, really good for just taking a quick look at CSVs. Yeah, a Google Sheets also works well, but not for like really big files. This works pretty decent for big files too. So yeah, I often. So I remember Alex. Alex showed us a really cool command line tool that does this. Stuff. It was like Vim. It was like an. It was like a Vim style Excel. I wish I could remember it because it did a lot of what we're doing right now. But this looks promising. I mean, see all these names? B-C-U-N-A-M seems, seems, seems like names for the BCUs. So I agree with that. I think we're onto something where eventually we could map the ID to these names. Bahamas. Hmm. Well, let me find... There's another data set in here called All Reefs. And let's see what's in there. Because... No, it also has object ID, which is just like an auto incrementing row, it seems like. Hmm. 
But uh, how are y'all doing in this in the Discord there? Uh, should we open it up for questions at this point? Yeah, I'm not sure we solved the audio issue, but if anybody wants to drop a question in the chat, I will read it for them and we can go through it. Yeah, we got a couple of people here. I heard from Nita, so she can unmute. That's promising. The thing is, Nita has a guest role. Oh, from right. She's already before, So that, that means that she entered the chat with the permissions already, which is probably why it's working. I see. Looks like Ben Davis is typing. I feel like we should be able to, like, change it in real time. Okay, here we go. How would you deal with the problem that the globe is the globe is massive, but coral reefs are tiny? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I don't, you, you can, we probably have differing opinions or I'm, I'm actually curious, but for me, it means, it often means to get away from a map. So like yeah. in the mock-up that I have, part of what we're doing is we have the map and we have a table. Right, so a non-geographic visualization that represents the thing, and then using the map as an index to know where to look. So the reason, like the part of the reason that we're using it for this is because we want to help people like spin the globe, and they might be from Mexico or Indonesia or Asia or South America, and they should all be able to see something close to them. But once it's time to actually analyze those things next to each other, it like I think it's good to get them out of the geographic side of things and we're going to be doing some of that in the table um maybe with like heat mapping or color mapping of the any value that we can get from it we're you know categorical mapping of the threat type with icons we're basically just improving the visual the ability for a user to like visually compare things that aren't right next to each other geographically but are right next to each other in terms of the data that's really interesting. So Ben says, could you exaggerate the size of the reefs at 100% and then show their accurate size on drill down? And absolutely, I think that another WCS project um, does this on their story map where it's it's like a summary when you're zoomed out and then it's sort of more detailed when you dive in. I think we could almost we could maybe even prototype how you might enable that because that would be, mm -hmm. we already tracked the zoom in the state so part of what you yeah. would do is you would just look at your zoom level and you would change your presentation by zoom level, which I think is a, like, I'm definitely down to try that. Yes. That's, that's what I was thinking as well. And I'm a hundred percent in agreement about getting away from a table that could be super powerful, uh, depending on how, how rich the metadata is. But one idea that I had was like, now that we have these things and we can color them, we can compute the centroid like the, the center or center of mass or some calculation to to summarize each of these regions as one point. And then once we have that, we can zoom out. And as we're zooming out, keep that point the same size on the screen. And so then even if you're zoomed out to a view where you can't see the in like the, the lowest level of detail, you could see one point for each coral reef. I agree with that. I think that on, the way I would do that is I would use turf for the center. Of yes, maps, and I turf. That in the chat. Turf but one amazing. thing I know is that turf, specifically turf, has a bug in the way it transpiles in Nuxt. So I would need oh, to no. do a little bit of magic to get it working. So I, I want to. I I don't want to do that because of that one particular reason. If that's mm -hmm. okay. Oh yeah, we could figure out how to do it. We could even pre-process it in like an external. That's exactly how I would want to do it. Yeah, I would want to loop the shape file and pre-process the centroid exactly based on the center of mass and like add that as a property in the G topo JSON or GeoJSON. For sure. But yeah, I could I could see that working out. And it goes with the labels too. Like once we get labels on here, I think it'll be a much richer exactly experience. But it is one of those like fundamental challenges. Like coral reefs are are really tiny, uh, in terms of. Do you want to try just experimenting? Like, can we? Do you want to try and hook in like a scale property to the to how to the map scaling? So like we just literally like size them up. I'm just curious. Like it's a you know what I mean to play around of like, like how do we exaggerate them when you're zoomed out? 
and like right. I think we can prototype that super quickly. Like, how do you make this bigger? Maybe even just a stroke, right? If you made a stroke that oh, was the yeah. same size, regardless of zoom, like that would show up when you're way zoomed out as, as something. Yeah, that's right? true. That's actually super low hanging fruit to just turn on right now. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, what's up? Yeah, so does path have a scale property? Path? Yeah, can you, like, can we Curran, can you show us, like, it? where the scale comes through in, in set state, right? Because you said before that when you pan and zoom, that changes the state as well. Is, can we, like, console log that? It does, and that's right here. It, it uses um, D3 zoom. And then whenever the zoom changes, it sets this property called scale. So it's state.scale. So we can just console.log state.scale and do some something conditional when the scale's at a certain threshold. So let me just start with console.log scale like this. And then we can get a sense of where it's at different levels. While you're doing that, Ben Davis had another message. He says, um, also, one thing that has an influence on vulnerability of reef to climate change, but is difficult to convey on the globe, is reef depth. Mm. So worth considering an ancillary thing to visualize. That's a really good. This is why I love doing these streams because that's exactly the type of thing that I wouldn't think of and love to hear. Yeah. So like, if I I think I saw that data point somewhere of like, I think there is some numeric value to talk about depth. It might even be the first one we saw mm -hmm. in that color scale on the felt map. Remember that like blue to orange scale? Yeah. That was the further away from the coast. Like that That might even have been reef depth that we were looking at before. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing in one of the research papers that the deeper reefs, and I, I may be getting this wrong, but something like, you know, depth of the reef has an impact on how vulnerable it is. Because the ones that are close to the surface, I guess, are more vulnerable. But if it's like way that deep. That makes total sense. Yeah. Right? If, if, you have, if you're fishing or you're bringing a big ship through, it makes sense that if you're like rubbing up against it theoretically or, or you know, your pollution yeah. is much closer to it, that you would have more damage. That makes sense to the caveman brain in me, right? Yes. I wish I could unmute. <laughs> I agree. Unmute him. Like I try. So you see, he has the guest role. The guest role should give you the ability to unmute yourself and hop in. What if I make him staff? Uh oh, well, then he has access to everything. Oh, Hello, this, can you hear? This, oh my gosh! Hey. Yes, I can hear you. Hello. Hi. Amazing. How How's it going? Um. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Enjoying the stream. Thank you for joining us. I really appreciate it. Oh, nice. No, it's, it's good. Good stuff. Um. Yeah, so, so I think sort of the deeper the reef, I mean, I mean, I'm not a coral reef expert, but the deeper the reef, the lower the vulnerability to bleaching is the biggest thing. Ah, oh, bleaching, so, right. Um, or bleaching, so you're less exposed to the sun's rays if you're if you're deeper down. And that's, um, yeah. Okay. That's really interesting. Is there, are there, so you were talking about like exaggerating smaller things. Are there other visualization problems that you run into a lot or, or sort of data problems that you're curious about the regard to to the to this uh you're talking about like uh these are two great questions and it sort of seems like these are things that you've already been dealing with and i'm wondering if there's anything no else no like no that. this is just things that i thought throughout the stream ah, okay. oh cool that's awesome thank you so much like i really love this level like that type of expert feedback that's really awesome so, so i'm not i'm not a coral reef expert but i was working i did my phd in uh, northern australia um in the sort of the, the middle of the great barrier reef but i was more focusing on the the coastal and estuarine waters inshore and during sort of how the mosaic of different habitats that make up the inshore um supports the the different fish um, hmm. and crustaceans that then eventually move out to the reefs as adults so i was kind of like combining the geometry of the different habitat types from this kind of sort of map view perspective and then figure out what's the the mix of those habitats and a configuration that best supports the species that people care about that's oh, really wow. interesting that's something we we're not we haven't dived too much into this that i really want i'm curious about of like the specific species that make a reef resilient 
to climate change because that's part of their I think they're analyzing it on like a reef level but obviously the next question if a reef is able to be resilient to warming what like what makes it resilient and that's obviously specific species yeah I mean I wouldn't say do you mean the species of coral yeah so it, it, it'd be interesting to see sort of how they're defining um what a vulnerable reef is right you know is it are they are they looking exclusively at the coral or is, are they considering a reef for the whole sort of ecosystem of things that that depend on it and sort of coexist with it um so i think I it's the latter sort of... so i had i was able to talk with tim mcclanahan who is i think the lead author on that study and his whole in our brief conversation his whole point was to have more pieces of data inform the model and he sort of he was mentioning that the more holistic of the data that you bring in, the better sense you have of A, mm -hmm. whether it is resilient and B, what what makes it resilient. So I think it's probably the latter of, the, of what you see. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I imagine it's like quite, quite complex index blending different tricks um, and you could probably sort of dial up different components of that depending on what you actually care about so there's probably not one answer to that's exactly to right a resilient reef, yeah it, de it depends on what you're putting in your model yeah yeah but i imagine sort of the in terms of the resilience if we're talking about resilience probably the biggest things that i'd guess would be the connectivity to other reefs to be mm. um supported so if things do start to go downhill then you can have sort of uh, the broadcast of spores from from other reefs to recolonize or you know fish and um, species that sort of depend on the reefs can be recolonized from nearby um, versus an isolated reef where you know if something goes wrong it's going to take a long time for that to recover mm. because wow. it's dependent that's really on sort of chance events and then yeah you got other things like the depth as you were saying, sort of the species of coral is probably a big thing. Um, so not all coral reefs are um, equivalent. You know, you get some sort of soft-bodied corals, some hard-bodied corals. The hard-bodied corals take a lot longer to colonize and develop into mature organisms, whereas soft bodies are a lot more resilient in, you know, it might only take like a couple of years rather than hundreds or thousands of years to, to get back right. to the state where they were, you know. That's wow. amazing. Yeah. So, so yeah, these are all things that I think we're trying to do like a lay person's understanding, but that's all stuff that I want to surface in a way that for anyone in the world, they should be able to go see the coral reef that's closest to them and understand a, does it have any of these resiliencies and B, if it does, like what makes it resilient? Is it a combination of the depth versus the distance versus the ecosystem that's there? Like that's, that's I'm, I'm really glad to be talking to you about this because that's exactly what i want to make uh understandable yeah. to the general public so any advice you have in terms of like i don't know if you explain this type of thing to like a friend at a bar but like if there's ways that you know to make these concepts understandable to the general public i would i would love think sort of if, have on that if you're basing this all on an index which is made up of various factors let's like, say so you got like a recipe of different things you're mixing um I've seen like the pudding do things like this when they're sort of, I don't know, they might be sort of rating beers based on various factors that make up a single, mm, a single right. figure where, where they give the user the ability to dial up those different things up and down so they can see what effect that has on how, how you're actually defining resilience. Wow. Defi yeah, yeah, that sounds awesome. Sort of de yeah, demystifies the index. index. Yeah. yeah. They have these different scores. And we could look into what they mean, but there's like one overall score and then there's scores with specific meanings that maybe we could expose to the user and like blend these in different ways. And we, we've also done this in previous climate change work before, right? Because there's almost a, there's usually a slider of like, how bad do you think it will be? Right. Or like, you know, how how many degrees do you think the Earth will rise? And then you can see different outcomes based on that. So maybe it's sort of an inter relation of that of like how bad do you think it will be and then what elements do you think will be most important and then you can see the reefs sort of scored with all of that you know as part of the index math
That's fascinating stuff, though. I hadn't really considered depth or connectivity. That's very interesting, connectivity. Yeah, when you say connectivity, it makes me want to get out of geography entirely and yeah. make like a force Let's network. Make a network. Or... Yo, network. Yeah, like network of coral the reefs. Network of coral reefs. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. Like, I don't think I've seen anything like that. I think you, you can get quite it's stuck it, get into the weeds of that when you factor in things like the, the currents right um, like the different systems which are conveying sort of coral spores and fish larvae so it gets quite complex so you're thinking like a phd though so i want to i would just do it in a dumb yeah. way where if they're within 100 miles right i draw a link between them and they're now related reefs regardless of direction or you know what i mean like some like caveman way of yeah. approaching that analysis right you could you could just piggyback off some academic research which has probably already done this that's true it might have actually defined sort of a network of um, connectivity scores amongst adjacent reefs that's because then you could say okay here's the reef that's nearest me and that i care about what are the reefs that it depends on right. in order or, or or that or that depend on it right yeah yes yeah. so so there are probably some interesting things going on with like what we call um, like mainland island dynamics hmm. where you might have like a central node in this reef network which is supporting all these other reefs around it and that's what makes it like a particularly crucial reef to conserve because it's not only sort of say a, like a big reef which supports lots of stuff itself but it's also acting as like a, a safety blanket right for a bunch of reefs around it see over in indonesia there's a lot of reefs that seem like a, a reef family so to speak. But then in other places, you have these very isolated reefs. Like some of them are clearly not connected with any any other ones. Like see here, down off the coast of Florida, these are like a little... If, if it were a network graph, this would be a clique, right? Like a little mm -hmm. tightly connected... A little, a little neighborhood. A little neighborhood here that's totally disconnected from the ones like over in... Like what is this, Saudi Arabia? Yeah. That's very interesting. Awesome. Well, I think we're about um about coming up on time here. Yeah, that was amazing. Thank you, Ben, for joining in and, and asking yeah, thank you so such much. great questions and, and talking us through that. If there's anybody else that wants to hop in and ask questions or give feedback, uh feel free. Yeah, anybody else here? Thanks, Ben. Let's probably remove the staff role. <laughs> yeah, please do. Thank yeah, you. Sorry. <laughs> um this I, I i i'm just gonna harp on it one more time like this is exactly why i like to do live streams is for interactions like that like it's so cool yeah. to have people who sort of know the subject matter and maybe don't know the data or you know aren't data visualization people and then that kind of <clears throat> that relationship or that conversation of knowing the right questions to ask plus us having the data and the ability to visualize it that's really fun totally Yes. See, Garfield is Garfield typing. Garfield is typing. How do I? And then let me see if there's any in the YouTube chat. No comments in the YouTube chat so far. Just people saying hello. I think temporarily enabling the staff role is yeah, the, is the it. key. Go for it. So I'm going to do that. So Garfield, see if you can. Feels like passive pair programming. I think you can unmute now if you want to speak. But no questions. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Our pleasure. This is awesome. I hope to do more stuff like this. Like, I want to make it a regular thing and, and sort of grow a community around it. So thanks for tuning in, Garfield 2023. Garfield was born this year. Awesome. Thank you, Nita, for joining. Yeah, thank and you for all joining. all of your awesome suggestions and collaboration. Yeah, that was awesome. All right. Well, I did put something in the agenda for show and tell, but I don't know if we have critical mass. But anybody want to uh, share anything they've been working on? Thanks, Izzy. Yeah, thanks for hanging out, Izzy.
This was uh, always my favorite part of the D3 meetups in San Francisco, the show and tell at the end where people could show cool stuff they've been working on. Any takers? Me too. It's it's the thing that makes me miss the physical meetups yeah. the most because I feel like it's hard on a stream or like in front of a bunch of virtual people to jump up and do it. But like it's um, I, no pressure. You know what I mean? Like it's very... I, I like I like that very low pressure way of being like, hey, I was working on this and a quick demo and that's it, right? Yep. All right, I guess let's call it. Cool. Nobody has anything. Awesome. Well, thank you, Curran, for doing these. Like, I <laughs> really appreciate you setting up this space and making making space for D3 meetups to exist again. It's really awesome. This is fantastic. Yeah. And thank you, AJ, for, for joining in this one. This was really awesome, dynamic. You know, both of us uh, took the lead at various points. This is exactly what I was hoping for. Awesome. Cool. Well, it was great hanging out with all of you. Have a great week. Awesome. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.